should call. Math was never our strong suit, but breaking down Ohio State football is. Sit back and join us for Buckeye Grove Instant Access, part of the Unscripted Ohio Podcast Network. You can do it! Brought to you by BuckeyeGrove.com. Post-game thoughts, immediate analysis, and much, much more to put the big game into perspective. Without any further delay of game, here's your host, Kevin New. Kevin, God damn it. It's Monday morning and you are listening to the BIA podcast. I guess by the time you're listening to this, it'll probably be the afternoon. We're recording it in the morning. Little industry trick right there. I am your host, Kevin Noon. We'll be joined in a minute by uh, Jacob Binge, one of our great interns over at uh, BuckeyeGrove.com. And we are coming out of a weekend where your Ohio State Buckeyes 38-25 winner over Penn State improved to 2-0. Penn State sitting at 0-2 in a crazy Big Ten season so far. It's a sprint with only eight games in this 8-plus-1 model. You got to win them all. You just got to win them all. That's what it is. Everybody knew this Penn State game would probably be Ohio State's biggest challenge. Now, that doesn't mean we can fast-forward it to the end of the season and say, you know, to hell with everything. But Ohio State now 37, 38-point favorite over Rutgers. We're not really going to get into that game at this point. We're looking back at this Penn State game. And let me welcome Jacob into the show and, you know, you know, first and foremost, welcome. And, you know, what were your thoughts, you know, just on, a, you know, on a surface level coming out of that Ohio State-Penn State game? Yeah, hey, Kevin, I appreciate being on the, being on the podcast. I, uh, I was really impressed with the way Ohio State played um, this weekend against Penn State, you know, despite it being a 13-point um, difference in scores. I really thought the offense made some significant um, impressions in terms of, you know, the passing game and, you know, Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, you know, putting up numbers that haven't been done before in program history. And then on the defensive side of the ball, just really impressed with those that defensive line um, and getting it done to shut down the Penn State run game. You know, let's let's start on the offensive side of the ball because I think that's where people's eyes are drawn. And Justin Fields, another huge game, 28 to 34. So, unfortunately, more than just one incompletion. Had six. Oh, my God, he's regressing. What the hell? But, um 28 to 34, 318, four touchdowns. Uh, you know, I think something else of note, he was only credited with six rushing attempts and with a couple of sacks in there. I mean, really, you know, take that down to four. Uh, you know, I, they they did a better job of not having to rely on his legs as much and, you know, him throwing the ball. I mean, really, it's just kind of a thing of beauty watching him, you know, command the offense out there. Yeah, you're exactly right. We knew coming out of last season that Fields was a incredible threat, you know, using his legs. And then after last week against Nebraska, where he rushed for like the second most um, attempts of his career, it was really surprising to see he had a negative, you know, rushing yardage this week, especially after the fact, you know, there was talk when we were hearing from Ryan Day that, you know, were some of these runs designed to be runs? Um, is he scrambling too much? Does he need to keep looking down the field longer? You know, I think he proved that against Penn State um, just in terms of rushing yard statistics and, you know, 318 passing yards. And, the, and then you look at, you know, the receivers, Wilson and Olave each go for 100 yards. I mean, uh, this is, you know, two straight games, some sort of school record. I know Jerry Emig, Ohio State Sports Information Director, sent one out, but... Uh, you know, it's it, it's crazy when you sit there and you see that the two of them combine for 18 receptions, 231 yards, and, and, and two scores. A lot of people want to sit there and say that maybe the tandem at Purdue of Rondale Moore and David Bell, and, you know, I, I don't know. I really didn't get to watch a lot of Big Ten football outside of uh, – the Ohio State game. It's funny, here in the second segment of the show, I'll be going solo talking about the Big Ten. Um, you know, they say that that might be, you know, the best duo in the conference. You know, I say, you know, I say shenanigans to that. I think this Wilson-Olave con uh, combo, it might be one of the best in the nation, especially when you sit there and you look at uh, Alabama losing, you know, losing their top receiver this year. You know, I, I struggle to find a, a more prolific duo than, than, than Garrett and Chris. Yeah, I think you bring up a great debate point right there. I think um, Olave and Garrett Wilson are among those that top tandem right there. And I think Garrett Wilson 
you know, proven that he can be versatile both on the ground and through the air. He had that end around run on the first drive that really set the tone going forward in that game. And, you know, having that versatility from that guy who was um, in the slot um, allows the guy like Chris Olave, who I thought was among the Buckeyes' biggest, you know, question marks coming into the game in terms of health status. After taking those big bumps last week against Nebraska, he really showed out and led um, led the Buckeyes in receiving yards, hauled in two more touchdowns, um, really put away all those questions concerning his health coming into the game. And how about the tight end position? Uh, I know you've only been with Buckeye Grove for a couple of months and you haven't been around for the, let's see, I started with Buckeye Grove in 2006. So we're talking a pretty long time here. Is this going to be the year of the tight end? I'm not ready to an- announce that this is going to be the year of the tight end, but that Penn State game may have been the game of the tight end. Uh, six receptions. Jeremy Ruckert had four you know, only for 25 yards, but a couple of scores, including his second one, which was on a fourth and one with a little, you know, a little, you know, uh, Justin Fields looks like he's going to dive. He takes a step forward, rocks back. Uh, Rucker releases into like the, the back left corner of the end zone, wide open touchdown there. Ryan Day gets on uh, the post game zoom afterwards and says that he kind of needed a drink after that whole, uh, that whole series and that play. But if you, if you, if you practice these plays and you execute these plays in practice, you have to be ready to call them. There's no reason to go through all of this, set it up only to, 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 to leave it in the playbook and, and not use it. Yeah, exactly. Right. And you know, they describing it that way is perfect because you can only imagine what opposed head coaches are feeling when they see that the Ohio state tight ends also prove to be an offensive threat. And I think, you know, having Olave and Wilson take up most of the time, probably in opposing film rooms, seeing guys like Jeremy Rucker and Luke Farrell and Jake Housen, you know, catches, make catches, um, all in touchdowns even, just makes the Ohio State offense more dynamic and so much more of a threat. Um, you know, I go back to the Big Ten title game last year where Rucker made that incredible, you know, pose in, that, in the catch in the back of the end zone. Kind of reminds me of the Jordan logo in a sense. Um, just shows just shows the athleticism that comes from that tight end position. Um, you know, they do a great job up front providing more protection, but they also show that they um they can haul in a pass when need to. Let's move to the rushing game. Uh, the, the the rushing total overall was down a little bit from the Nebraska game. They rushed for two hundred and eight yards on forty five carries, an average of about four and a half yards, only one touchdown on the ground, but Master Teague, 110 yards on 23 carries, had a score. 31 yard was uh, yarder was as long, but looked like a looked like he was more in sync with the game. I think the run blocking was there, and then then you look at Trey Sermon. He had 13 carries for 56 yards, uh, 4.3 average. I wouldn't say that he didn't have a good game. I I thought that he just wasn't. I don't think he had the same opportunities maybe that Teague did, but. Where are you in, in your thoughts about where this rushing game is as they get ready to go into what should, at least on paper, be a little bit of an easier stretch over the next two with Rutgers and Maryland? Yeah, I share some of those uh, thoughts there. I think he definitely looked um, more like he was getting through the holes that were provided by the offensive line that, you know, kind of won the offense, the, uh, the line of scrimmage, rather. I think Sermon, um, you know, in the first half I was watching to see who was that guy getting the ball on like third and short opportunities. And it looks like Sermon was that guy early on, but he got those opportunities um, in the second half. So I'm still kind of, um, you know, it's a bit of a dilemma seeing which running back gets those opportunities on third and short. It's clear that T, you know, is getting the lion's share of opportunities, like you mentioned. Um, but I think for me, you know, Sermon is somebody who is going to have to step up more. Um, And he's doing all he can, you know, in those third and short opportunities. um, He's picking up 56 yards this week, and I think he had about 48-ish last week. Um, He's doing what's asked of him. Uh, He's just not getting those opportunities like he is. And you can see that in the amount of carries that um, the two of them are getting. Before we get to the defense, I want to talk about maybe one of the oddest situations that I have seen in quite some time. And we're – At the end of the half, of the first half, Ohio State has the ball. They uh, take their timeouts to get the ball back, Uh, you know, have the ball with about mm, two minutes to go, really aren't able to do much with it. It's um, fourth down. They're 
two seconds left after a stoppage. Ohio State, you know, Justin Fields snaps the ball, takes a second, takes a knee, and teams go off the field, presumably to go to the to the locker rooms, and then everybody is summoned back to the field because they determined that something that looked like it should have taken at least three seconds, if not four seconds, only took one second, and uh, Penn State was able to get the ball back as quote unquote a turnover on downs, and then kick a fifty yard uh, field goal and get you know essentially, you know if you if you're looking at it from an Ohio State perspective, uh, three uh, free points on that. You know what was what was your view on that? Watching it on TV and kind of seeing that unfold. Yeah, it was a it was a strange um, sequence of events there, and I think Ryan Day said it best in the post game presser. It was just a completely mismanaged opportunity. Um, I think there was, what, like two or three seconds on the clock. It's something where, um, you know, it could be better handled. Uh, Fields did all he could to get that knee down. And whoever was watching the clock was really watching the clock. Um, and made sure Penn State had um, whatever was left on the clock and, you know, to take advantage of that. And, you know, props for kicking that 50-yard field goal. That's, that's still a long field goal. Um, but that's something that Ohio State could have um, handled better. Ryan Day knows that. Fields knows that. Ohio State knows that. Um, but, man. What a head scratcher. <laughs> yeah, I, when I got back from State College on Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, I uh, immediately went to that part of the game. And, you know, it's kind of like the difference between a hand time 40 and a laser 40. You're not going to get it exactly right. And we're not, you know, in college football, we're not dealing with tenths of a second on a clock like we are in terms of basketball. But every single time that I I timed it, and I did this like 10 different times from – the snap to the whistle, it never took less than 2.35 seconds and would take as much as 3.1 or so. I don't have my scratch notes in front of me at the moment. So let's just say, you know, in terms of argument's sake, if there was like, if the two seconds that were on the clock were truly like a 2.9 but then it also felt like the clock rolled late. So I don't know. I really just have a hard time with with all of that. But, you know, it didn't end up affecting the game. We've seen some calls from officials already this year have direct impacts. Um, East Carolina kind of got hosed in a game uh, earlier this week. I didn't really get to see it, but I saw social media go nuts on it. But that's neither here nor there. This is the Buckeye Grove Instant Access Show, not the East Carolina Pirates Instant Access Show. We'll let them talk about that. But let's you know, let's move on to the defense. Uh, kind of a tale of two halves in a lot of regards. Ohio State holds Penn State to just 75 yards of offense in the first half. Really unable to run the ball. It looks like it's just a lot of Sean Clifford on the ground. They tried to tried to hit it a couple times with Devin Ford. That didn't work. They even had some of their young backs, their true freshmen out there. Second half was a little bit of a different story, but uh, you know, just you know, your thoughts on on those first half efforts. Yeah, coming into the season, the biggest question mark, you know, as a team was that defensive line having to replace three of the four starters up front. And I think um, they showed signs of potential in the first game, but man, they really showed out. Um, against Penn State, and you can see that um, from Togi. You can see that from Haskell Garrett, and he what an incredible story from him. Um, first of all, um, but you know, just going forward, the linebackers really improved um, against Penn State. You know, seeing Pete Warner and Chuck Borland, you know, have two of the top four amount of tackles. Um, they've made some strides. They can still improve, in my opinion. Um, and then the secondary also, um, you know, kind of on and off at times. Um, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the defense as a whole, really impressive showing against Penn State, despite the 25 points on the scoreboard. Then in the second half, Penn State gets 250 yards of total offense. It feels like in some regards, and we're not really going to get back into the Ohio State offense, that they were just kind of in the let's salt the clock away mode. They were running. I mean, they did have some passing touchdowns for sure, but uh, you know, it didn't seem like the same sense of urgency was there while Penn State furiously was trying to come back uh, receiver Jahan Dotson had a couple of just incredible catches over Ohio State's top cornerback, Sean Wade. Now, I went back and I watched those closely, and you know, I, I, a lot of people, especially people over on our message board, were saying Sean Wade just cost himself a lot of money there. But 
I don't know. I I I I look and it. I mean, Sean Clifford threw some perfectly thrown passes. Jahan Dotson, you know, especially on the first one, made a great catch. On the second one, maybe he pushed off a little bit, but you know, it it, it it's over and it's done with. You can't, you know, you're not going to be able to go back and relitigate it. But you know, while I'd sit there and say that Sean Wade was not able to go out there and make you know make the spectacular play on it, he was in position both times. It just you know, I just think that the offense was better able to execute there than the defense was. And, you know, it, it happens sometimes in football. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, am, am, I, am I crazy in thinking that? No, I definitely agree with you in a sense. You know, give credit to John Dawson for making two incredible catches. I think they were on back-to-back plays even um, where he hauled in one of those touchdowns with one hand in a sense. Um, but Sean Wade did his job. You know, he was given coverage. And he said earlier in the week when we talked to him, You know, Penn State receivers, they're different receivers. And that number five, which turned out to be Dotson, um, very quick guy, deep ball threat. And we saw that, and it's evident in the scoreboard, or the box score, rather. And, um, you know, Wade really did all he could there. Um, The secondary as a whole allowed about 281 receiving yards. So, um, big game there from Penn State. Um, And I think it all kind of balanced out there. Marcus Hooker got that interception, which I thought was overdue. Um, I thought Ohio State should have pulled one out in the first game, but I was glad to see them um, get it towards the end to ice the game there. Um, but, yeah, the secondary on and off of points, like I mentioned, um, and it's going to be something that I'm going to be interested to watch going forward. You're listening to the BIA Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Noon. I'm joined by Jacob Binge as we are talking about Ohio State's big 38-25 win over Penn State this past weekend. Uh, you touched upon the defensive line. You touched upon Haskell Garrett, but I want to touch upon – Tommy Togiai, three sacks in that game. Uh, you know, some of that was affected by, you know, Haskell Garrett at one point forced Clifford to step up in the pocket and into Togiai's arms, but you know, leads the team with seven tackles. Just, you know, just an incredible game. I think we were very concerned going into the season. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I was very concerned when we weren't sure what the status of Garrett was going to be, what the status of Teron Vincent was going to be. He played in his first action of the season after missing the, missing the opener. But, damn, Tammy, uh, Tommy Togi, I went out there and just created havoc. And now that they seem to have their full complement of, of, of weapons in terms of their interior linemen, uh, you know, Ohio State's defensive tackles are, you know, are a strong point, at least based on, on eight quarters of football that I've seen so far. Oh, yeah, 100%. When we talked to Larry Johnson earlier um, in the preseason, he mentioned, um, and Griffin even wrote this at the bottom of one of his stories, that it was a collection of no-names. In the sense. These guys, um, they're hungry to make their names known, to burst onto the scene and fill these holes that were left by last year's um, defensive line. And Jonathan Cooper said it after the game, you know, that's it, just kind of in terms of his own personal statistics. But really, they all worked in tandem with one another, stopping the run game. And, and no matter where the numbers fell, The Ohio State defensive line was undoubtedly, in my opinion, the strongest point of that defense. Last thing I want to talk with Jacob here before we take a quick break on the show is, you know, we go through Ohio State wins the game by 13 to the betting public. That was of note because I saw the line anywhere from 10 and a half to 13. So if you got them at 13, it was a push. Um, But, you know, this is not a betting tip show, but it could be. But, um, you, you you look at a lot of the statistics. You look at the flow and the feel of the game. To me, it didn't feel like it was a 13-point margin. I mean, yeah, there were some maddening moments down the end where, you know, they just couldn't they couldn't apply the pressure to Penn State's neck enough to get them to go to sleep. But Ohio State felt like that it really dominated this game much more than maybe what the score would have indicated. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I can definitely uh, agree with that. Um, you know, you take away that um, the weird clock management at the end of the first half that would uh, that added three points to Penn State, and if Ohio State makes those two missed field goals, it's a forty-four to twenty-two game. That's that's a doubling um, in terms of score there. Just looking at the total yards, five um, five hundred twenty-six from Ohio State, three hundred twenty-five for Penn State, and that's an incredible difference there. Um, time of possession is what really sticks out to me. Ohio State had the ball for thirty-seven minutes and one second. Penn State had it for 22 minutes and 59 seconds. So really big difference. That really shows how commanding Ohio State was on offense, um, just really dragging out the clock, and how dominant the defense was in, you know, shutting down Penn State and getting the ball back on offense for the Buckeyes. 
I agree. I agree on all fronts there. And I want to thank Jacob for joining us here on the show. We will come back. Well, I will come back on the other side of this quick break and we'll kind of, and I'll go over the rest of the big 10 and maybe start setting the scene for Rutgers. You are listening to the BIA podcast, part of the Buckeye Grove sports network. Egg water conditioning has been treating well in city water in central Ohio with American made water filtration products for over 60 years. Have a water quality problem? The water treatment experts at Haig know how to solve it. Not sure if your water softener is working? They will test, inspect, and sanitize any brand of water softener for only $20. Schedule a system checkup or water test today by calling 614-836-2195 or visit them online at HaigH2O.com. That's H-A-G-U-E-H2O.com. Welcome back to the BIA podcast. I am your host, Kevin Noon. I want to thank Jacob Binge once again for joining us in the first segment to talk about Ohio State, Penn State. Now let's talk about the weekend that was. Let's start nationally on on a on a quick note, and then we'll get into the Big Ten. I guess the biggest news was the Clemson-Boston College game where Clemson had to rally from behind, scoring the last 21 points in the second half to take a 34-28 win at home over BC, who came out and really shocked the uh, Trevor Lawrence-less uh, Tigers. Uh, you know, you have to give a lot of credit to Clemson for fighting back in this game and really answering the call. And you got to give a lot of credit to Jeff Halfley's Boston College team as well for getting into that type of situation, up 24-13 at halftime, but just couldn't couldn't be – they couldn't carry it for four quarters. And, you know, that's a tough situation. I'm not saying that – it would have been different if it were in Chestnut Hill and they were playing at BC, but going into Death Valley and being able to pull that one off would have been difficult. Alabama, 41 nothing winner over Mississippi State. Notre Dame was a 31-13 winner over Georgia Tech. UGA beats Kentucky, 14-3. Another uh, top 10 upset, or I guess the first one at this point, Oklahoma State it loses 41-34 to Texas in overtime. That really now is the end of the Big 12 in terms of any true post-game consideration for the college football playoff. No undefeated teams in the Big 12 at this point. Cincinnati 49-10 over Memphis. Texas A&M 42-31 over Arkansas. And University of Florida at number 10, 41-17 over Missouri in a game that featured quite the brawl after uh, Kyle Trask was hit apparently late on a play. Dan Mullen jumps out there and acts a fool, and it ends up leading to a halftime brawl with a couple, three ejections. Honestly, I think that uh, Dan Mullen should be suspended for at least a game. Uh, you know, let let them on the people on the field take care of that type of situation, but you're jumping around out there acting like an idiot is not going to help the situation. And, you know, he comes out, the team goes into the locker room, he comes back out, waves his arms around the swamp like a jackass, and, you know, not, you know, it's not helping any type of situation. Then he dresses up like Darth Vader for, you know, it's a Halloween game for the post-game situation. You know, I think he needs to be have his head checked. I mean, what what is he thinking in that type of situation? Yeah, you know, all right. Congratulations, your team's three and one. You are a pretty good coach, but I don't know. I'm just not going to be able to look at you the same way here for a while because it really seemed like you melted down on Saturday and kind of had a little bit of a mental lapse. We'll we'll we'll, we'll say it's a mental lapse. Let let's let's just say that. Um, any other upsets in the top 25? Number 15, North Carolina loses at UVA 44-14. Number 16, Kansas State gets demolished by West Virginia 37-10. And I think that is it. No other upsets in top 25 play. Uh, jumping to the Big Ten on Friday, Maryland beats Minnesota 45-44 in a, in a game that certainly had its runs. Uh, Maryland comes out up 21-7 after the first quarter. Minnesota scores the next 21 points. Uh, you know, it, it ends up going to overtime as as Maryland comes roaring back, score outscores uh, the visiting uh, Gopher 17-0 in the fourth quarter. Maryland scores on its first uh, possession in overtime. Minnesota 
answers in a full, uh, four play drive as well. Minnesota has been decimated at the specialist position and it's place kicker cannot convert on the point after 45, 44 is your final, um, Michigan, Michigan state, Michigan, a huge favorite in this game, huge favorite Mel Tucker's first rivalry game as the head coach of the Spartans. Michigan should, you know, win that game by three scores or not more. Um, Joe Milton, you know, Cam Newton, whatever, whatever the, all the people out there want to say, you know, that he reminds them of, he didn't, he didn't have it in this game. Sure. He threw for 300 yards on 51 attempts, no touchdowns. Uh, the running game, the Michigan running game seems to be a bit of a liability right now. Blake Corum had a couple of scores. Hassan Haskins had one, um, but they weren't able to run with any consistency whatsoever. It wasn't that running was just kind of a neutral situation. Running was a negative for them. It really was a negative. Whereas Rocky Lombardi on the other side, he he had a great pitch and catch game with Ricky White, who had eight receptions for a buck ninety six and a score. Uh, Michigan State goes up by ten with about five six minutes left in the game. Connor Hayward catches a uh, Rocky Lombardi touchdown from a, inside of twenty yards. Michigan takes up until about 35 seconds left in the game to score a touchdown to cut it to three onside kick. Those generally are not going to happen. It didn't in this case. Paul Bunyan statue is going to East Lansing as Michigan not only loses to Michigan State, but they lose at the big house. So that's a big one. Uh, Indiana 37-21 in that battle of unbeatens. Granted, 1-0 teams. The Hoosiers sitting 2-0 now. Uh, you know, they're a pretty good story. I think uh, Tom Allen has done a great job there. We'll see what happens moving forward, though. I mean, it's not going to be an easy ask for them having Michigan coming up. That is going to be a, a tough one for them for sure, uh, regardless of what happened. And then they got at Michigan State, at Ohio State. So we'll learn a lot about uh, the Hoosiers at this point. Rutgers had a nice run going 1-0. Uh, Purdue seven points better than Illinois. Uh, that game a lot closer on the scoreboard than what it really was. The uh, Illini scored the final 14 points of the game to really you know tighten it up, but it wasn't that tight of a game. Brandon Peters, quarterback for the Illini, uh, tested positive for the COVID. He was out. I think a backup quarterback was out as well too. A uh, third string quarterback had to go forward for the Illini. Not a good situation. Purdue sitting 2-0. Uh, Northwestern ends up coming back in the third quarter to take a 21-20 win over the Hawkeyes in a in a sneaky good game. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of scoring in it. Uh, but, you know, they, at the end of the day, Northwestern was able to get the defensive stops that it needed down the stretch. But Iowa certainly was not helping its own cause with some just unfortunate types of plays that happen along the way, and I'll kind of leave it at that. And then, of course, Wisconsin-Nebraska was canceled when something like a dozen players and 10 staffers or whatnot all tested positive for COVID. We should learn on uh, Tuesday, I guess, if the upcoming game for the for the uh, Badgers – will take place or not you know maybe it may even take a little bit longer for that but that's a game against um purdue um you know scary situation we just don't know what's going to happen at this point you know with the quarterback still in the you know in the 21 day protocol situation for uh the positive tests it's not like they're going to necessarily be in better shape in terms of what you know what type of personnel they're going to be able to put out there when, when you decide, you know, it wasn't like they hit red, red is my understanding of the situation to where the league shut them down. They chose to shut themselves down, even though, I mean, let's be honest, they were dealing with some serious, uh, missing players on the team, but, uh, you know, do they, do they sit there and shut that game down? Would they be ready to go against Michigan, uh, on the 14th? If you're talking about a 21 day window. I don't know if we know the situation there. You look at Trevor Lawrence, who will not be playing for Clemson in the Notre Dame game, but they have a 10-day window. I think it's really 11. I think it's 10, plus you have to be fever-free the next day. I heard some of the talking heads on the national shows saying that 
it might be best for the Big Ten to revisit its 21-day situation. You know, maybe take it back to 14 because we're not seeing evidence in terms of general population of the myocarditis being a real issue, especially in athletes. And that final week, that extra, you know, days 15 through 21 were in place for additional testing in terms of that and as kind of a an on-ramp for these guys to return back to competitive play. I really have no faith that the Big Ten is going to amend the decision. I mean, I think in a lot of ways we should just sit there and be happy that we have football at all in the first place. And that's, you know, that's kind of a, a crummy outlook to have on this, to be like, well, just be happy for what you got. But with what Big Ten leadership showed us during this whole process, spending all this, you know, being the first ones to come out and say, we're going league only, but being the last ones to come out with a schedule, but being the first ones to come out and walk away from its schedule to mothball the season, to then dragging its feet, really having to be drugged to the altar, kicking and screaming to come back and have football. Why should we have any faith whatsoever that the conference is going to do the right thing and take this back down to 14 days and bring the Big Ten closer to in line with the rest of the Power Five conferences? So that'll be something to keep an eye on. Uh, Barry Alvarez, uh, AD at Wisconsin, was on one of the national pregame shows. Was quick to point out, he's just an AD, not a doctor. That decision's going to have to be made by doctors. I'd love to say that that decision would be in the hands of like somebody like Dr. Jim Borchers from Ohio State, who was a true leader during this situation, who really brought a lot of sanity to an insane room. But we know it's not going to be his decision. It's going to be a bunch of egghead academics who have already had to revisit a situation that was, air quotes, not going to be revisited. So I can't see these gigantic egos going back on themselves yet again in this situation. So I don't know. I don't know what the schedule is going to look like moving forward, but I do know that the Buckeyes are 2-0. and I do know that the Buckeyes have Rutgers coming up uh, this weekend. We will be talking to an expert from our Rutgers site on our Friday show to get some insights there. Plus, we'll have a full week of breakdowns of what this uh, this win really showed us about the Buckeyes this week and you know what to look forward to in terms of the uh, Scarlet Knights for this next week even if you know even if they did get that first big win of the season not so much in week 2 and it should probably be a pretty bad bludgeoning in week 3 but uh, we'll save all of that for later i want to thank y'all for listening to the, to me on the BIA podcast the Buckeye Grove Instant a- Access podcast be sure to catch up with all of our news on BuckeyeGrove.com. And if you're not a member yet, sign up. Come on. Come on board. See what it's all about. I promise you'll enjoy it. But, you know, for you know, for a Monday afternoon, I guess we started in the morning, and now we're here into the afternoon as it's taken us all day to record. I want to thank you for listening. I'm your host, Kevin Noon, and have a wonderful day, and go Bucks. Be sure to stay up to date with Buckeye Grove Instant Access when the news breaks or after the big game. Exclusively at BuckeyeGrove.com or anytime on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher as part of the Unscripted Ohio Podcast Network. Hit that subscribe button so you can stay in the know and never miss a single episode. watching be sure to click on that subscribe button so you don't miss a single thing come visit us over at buckeyegrove.com for all the best ohio state information on the web